afternoon and welcome to NTV this great afternoon. Now a lot is happening around the world, but today we're finalizing our serialized conversation about the top um, mid-size, uh, rather small and medium enterprises, that is top SMEs at 2020. And well, a couple of things are happening. I want to first thank those who have been a part of this conversation since when we started in the first edition to this final one. Now, over 200 million small businesses around the world need financing to invest, grow, and create new jobs. But we know that SMEs need more than financing to thrive. They need access to information, markets, and technology to become more productive, efficient, and resilient. They also need access to resources that can help strengthen their well-being. Increasingly, banks and fintech companies are becoming embedded in the SME ecosystem and playing a key role beyond finance to build and grow the capabilities of small businesses. Now, bringing us to a conversation dubbed how SMEs can resource for efficiency during the COVID-19 period. Now, to bring this home, I am honored to host Mr. Ofumbi Oscar G, the director, seven my SME, and uh, that is care of Bolton Business School. And then we have a Mr. Robert Wanok. He's not here today with us, but today we are having um, we are having someone totally different. But from the Uganda Investment Authority, we are having Mr. Eria Kawe Kaweire Kaweire Kawedeku area from the Uganda Investment Authority. And not forgetting, we still have Mr. Basila Jar. This is the tech the Techpreneurship Ministry, um, Techpreneurship Director from the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. It's a lot more going on. Believe you me, with these titles, we'll find a way to go around them. I'm Andrew Chamagiro, and this show is live on a Facebook and YouTube that is NTV Uganda. And the hashtag is top. 100 SMEs at 20. Now, this show is powered by Uganda Investment Authority, MOSTI, and the DFCU Bank. MOSTI stands for Minister of Science, Technology, and Innovation in partnership with KPMG and the Daily Monitor. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Well, it has been quite a long journey from where we started. That was the first episode, and I really want to commend the Uganda Investment Authority. I still want to, um, to thank the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation and above all, I want to thank all SMEs. You represent, Oscar, represent all the SMEs that are in this country. And a lot has been going on now. I will start with you. You're the CEO of Save My SME. And um, what is your story? We need to know your story and what impact has Save My SME had, especially during the COVID-19 disruption. Yes. Mm. Our, um, I'm a founder and CEO. Mm. Business is basically focused on <coughs> production. Mm. And so when COVID 19 came, it shifted everything in order to do it. Mm. And uh, in that, we basically made sure that 100% of our revenue is going back to my clients. Wow. And uh, so the realization was that when we have another business, I bring the gentleman. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And during that time, we tried to take stock. Mm. What is it that we have that we can actually uh, work with? Apart from the vans. Yes, well, mm. apart from <laughs> those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, so we discovered that we have both experience and mm. also professional uh, knowledge. Mm. And we chose to take that and use it in a way that was a little much better than we had originally done. Mm -hmm. So what we discovered is that uh, from our experience and uh, professionalism, we could actually share it with the uh, companies that were allowed to work mm -hmm. during the uh, lockdown season. So right. uh, when we did that is then we went out to meet some of these companies mm. and to <coughs> help them organize uh, a host of that. Because mm. the, the core of what we had was really the uh, compliance and uh, legal. Then we also had our, uh, the business operations, uh, human resource, uh, mm. technology as well. Mm. And uh, even during that time, we developed our uh, home learning platform, uh -huh. uh, which is uh, school2go.com. It didn't uh, go the way we anticipated, uh, but we have tweaked it uh, to date mm. so we can focus on uh, STEM and uh, uh, French uh, language and culture. Mm. And so um, we discovered that uh, a lot of these uh, businesses that uh, we 
we interacted with uh, some of them were forest girls. Many of them were. Um, we also had interactions with the Uganda Small Scale uh, Association, mm. some banks, and then uh, equally uh, a number of other SMEs. Mm. So while interacting with them, we discovered that okay, so there is actually a need. And then when we um, found out that even others have a particular challenge, mm -hmm. and we looked at the landscape, uh, for example, uh, many professionals were actually losing their jobs due to uh, the COVID uh, economics. Mm. And so we chose to um, create a platform uh, which was technically looking at linking these uh, respective uh, <coughs> economies mm. uh, with the professionals that were currently unemployed. So wow. that's where we get the semi SME umbrella. Wow. And so uh, in that we say if we can do this, then others can actually benefit from this uh -huh. platform. So it's more of a synergy that goes around. Yes. So you find uh, the uh, professionals that are unemployed, uh -huh. and then you find SMEs. Good SMEs actually need professional help and uh -huh. can't afford to pay uh, the full price for it. Mm. So uh, in doing that, we decided to create this forum. And so really, the SMI SME forum is uh, one where professionals are meeting SME owners that uh -huh. actually need professional help. Wow. Interesting. That is uh, one of my panelists today. That is uh, Oscar G. Ofumbi, the director of Semi SME. Coming to you, director um, Ajar. Should I say Basil? When it gets to innovation, he has mentioned something to do with STEM. Now, that is very interesting. Where do you see this nation going with regards to STEM? We had a program that was called, was it Andela? And it was closed when so, uh, from South Africa. It was closed all... And what became of our nation, personally, I went in panic. I'm one of those parents who went in panic because I was interested in STEM. Mm. Where do you see your ministry plugging in, especially to support such projects like STEM? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, mm. Minister of Science, Technology, and Innovation, like mm. you rightly mentioned, is a government ministry, which is... Uh, recently created to support... The best uh, ministry, from yeah. my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Which is created to support, actually, to support innovation <coughs> and support technology development oh, yes. in Uganda. Like Oscar said, uh, you find that uh, the SMEs are doing lots of things. Mm. We are trying to inspire our children at school. Mm. We're talking about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm. We are trying to say put a practical application to the knowledge that you gain. Mm. And we cannot wait until somebody has graduated from <coughs> university, then you start supporting them. Mm -hmm. So what we do as a ministry, we, we come with what is called innovation challenge. We move around to schools, we go mm. to primary schools, we go to secondary schools, and we give them a particular theme. Mm. And say, we want you to compete in these areas. Mm. They design all types of things in this world. Others are coming with local incubators, mm. others are doing uh, modern gardening tools, and all types of innovation. Mm -hmm. We evaluate. And then the best, the best few students are selected, and then they're given support. So that you develop that, that idea, that mm. concept into a prototype. Because you know the chain of <coughs> innovation. From idea, you need to actually to, to, to improve on it. Mm. Once you've come with the prototype, then you need to access the mm. market. You cannot, <coughs> you cannot progress an innovation when there is no market for whatever you're trying to produce. Mm. So as a ministry, we support STEM both in primary and secondary schools. And for university students, also we have an anniversary of competition that mm. we call them too, and then we support them. Wow. Yes. Um, still in that regard, what is government doing to encourage technological innovations, uh, especially access to technological uh, solutions by the SMEs, but not only that, resource using technological tools for the SMEs? First and foremost, you need the right infrastructure to support mm. oh innovation yes. because uh, you need uh, what we call the technology and business incubators. Mm. If you go to institutions like in Makere University, mm. you go to Uganda Industrial Research Institute mm. and different institutions of learning, mm. the ministry is supporting what is called technology and business incubation. Mm. You may call it incubation facilities. Where you have an idea, and you have the idea you should go to a particular place where mm. you can be mentored, where you can be supported, right. where the, the, the right tools, the, the, you have the laboratories, depending on the type of idea you have. You progress that idea you have up to a prototype in an environment which actually allows you to do that. Mm. We're also doing what is called uh, science and technology parks. We're in collaboration with universities to support research because <coughs> we're trying to tie research to the product. 
Perfect. You don't want research to be independent of the needs of the society. Mm -hmm. When the SMEs come from the Oscars of this world, they should meet with the academia who have done research, who has fine-tuned the ideas, and then we reach the aspects of commercialization. Mm -hmm. So what you do what is called the triple helix. Bring the academicians, mm -hmm. bring the, the private sector or mm -hmm. the business community, mm -hmm. And then you also bring the financiers, the banks, the insurance companies, you know, nice. all these people to support innovation. Mm. So science technology parks, we have technology business incubators. We're also encouraging uh, to, to source partnership. We're encouraging technology transfer development centers. Uh, the ministry is working with UN Technology Bank to come with what is called technology access partnership. We allow the local manufacturers in Uganda. We are targeting actually the manufacturers who are doing bioengineering, mostly mm. medical equipments, mm -hmm. because recently saw that in, in COVID, <coughs> we are really <coughs> challenged. There are so many issues. Yeah, so yeah. You, you connect the experienced manufacturers from the developed world to the local manufacturers. You exchange ideas, you exchange the data, mm. and skills, and all that, so that you are able to work together and upgrade. That's the reason why you quickly see that uh, in the recent past, give a, give a basic example of mask. Yes. When COVID started, we all thought, okay, we can't access the <coughs> mask here, but mm. we quickly upgraded the capacity to URI, Uganda Industrial Research Institute. Mm. And I, I can happily mention that most of the mask, the first mask that we use currently in the country is mm. coming from Uganda Industrial Research Institute because right. of the infrastructure which was put in place. Mm. Yes. Our government is doing a great job there. I'll come back to you a little later to explain... Um, to share with us the digital strategy as a nation yes. that we can be in position to plug in. Yes. Well, um, Eria, good to see you from the Uganda Investment Authority. And um, Eria is a senior investment executive from the Uganda Investment Authority. Um, he comes with a wealth of seniority and investment. For starters, last week um, in our last conversation, we had uh, Barbara Kabuchu here. Um, she gave us a link that connected us to the different models that were well researched by the Uganda Investment Authority where Ugandans could plug into. But it was a little bit more snappy because time was running mm -hmm. a little. Just to take you a little <coughs> back, can you explain more about that? Um, thank you, Andrew. Mm. The Uganda Investment Authority uh, identified about 50 business ideas mm -hmm. which are quick selling <coughs> okay. and we undertook research, uh, did market research, product research and mm. developed uh, the a compendium. This is the, the type of a compendium we developed. Okay. So these ideas are, are well researched and now the, uh, we call on SMEs mm. partake them uh, so that they can um, do the market acceleration for them. Mm. Uh, they cross cut through all the sectors mm. and we focused on the vision 2040 where the, the sectors government is focusing on ag agriculture, mm. tourism, minerals yeah. and the energy and then the services. So they are already researched and they are available. We have the hard copy, like this one I've, I've shown you, and mm. then the link which Barbara showed you. Okay, so if, 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 if an MSME and I, I, I go on that platform, I can just read through and if I like the idea, do I come and register with you and I, I roll out no, the idea? No, they are, they are, they are already uptakes. So you, you just, just take it out and you execute and it? you start off. Ah! <laughs> And See? The, the good thing is that even the, the monies which are developed, they are also in, into sizes. We have wow. one, the ones for micro, we have the ones for small, and the one for medium enterprises. Mm. So it's you to see how, which, si which level you, you want to grow with. Well, my dear Ugandan who is watching NTV this afternoon, that is very exciting, especially for the youthful like me who love to get into business. I understand a couple of you are on Twitter, but you possibly don't understand this. But just to take a little bit back in our previous conversation, this is a link you need to go to. These businesses are well researched. When you get there and you tap on the business, you will read. These are scientifically proven approaches. So just go there, download it, execute it, and we'll get rolling. Thank you so much, Uganda Investment Authority. Now, back to you. What lessons should SMEs speak from the experience? Um, and what is government doing especially uh, through to take through the Ugandans using the Uganda Investment Authority to grow supply chains within the country? Because they're terrible now. Yeah, uh, the supply chains of uh, which developed uh, the SM is hard. Mm -hmm. Got a, a problem during the COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. But what government had done already, we had started building the logistic subs. Okay. There's one we developed in Gulu. Mm -hmm. We are developing one in Namave. We are going to develop one in uh, Chetumi. Mm. In these logistics subs, we believe that SMEs need these warehouses mm. so that they can bring their goods and store there. 
we are there near to the main roads mm -hmm. and the, the rail connectivity. But that is now the hardware side. Okay. On the software side, we tell uh, SM is to try business to businesses. Because mm -hmm. now we have the big people who need materials. Oh, yes. For example, East African breweries may be wanting sorghum. Mm. Then the SMEs are growing sorghum. Oh, yeah. So that business to business linkage is what they need it to grow them. The gap, yeah. Exactly. Then, of course, uh, government has the where warehouse receipt system mm. whereby SMEs take their goods to the warehouses and they are given receipts so that they can come and claim for money. That is also to uh, buffer them from the supply defects. Mm. Then uh, the other thing is entering joint ventures with the FDI. Mm. Uh, you come to Uganda Investment Authority, we link you to the big investors mm. and then you enter into a joint venture either to subcontract or to un 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 unband a contract mm. so that you can meet what that part of the contract which you can do. You can play with him. You see, Elia, th that sounds very interesting and all that for free. It's for free. Now, it's a government service. The problem is that comes in, and these are questions that kept coming even when Barbara was here. Mm. There is a ceiling. Some people feel when they get there, uh, you should possibly know an area in there. You should know some director in there. How credible is this? Can I just come through and I walk through and I say, I'm an SME. I want to supply or get into an FDI with such and such an investor. Andrew, I've been Are there procedures that yes, could... Uh, yes, there's a, proce there's a process, and I've been always telling uh, my colleagues in the top 100 SMEs, mm -hmm. uh, for the past three or five years, I've been telling them all government incentives, mm. all government services are free, but mm. there's always a catch. Mm. You must be li a licensed investor. Compliant. A licensed investor. Mm. And SMEs have to undertake this, and they have to start ride riding on this. Mm. And the Uganda Investment Authority put up a one-stop center. Uh. Where all government agencies sit there, Uganda Revenue Authority, Uganda National Bureau of Standards, uh. Uh, Registration Services Bureau, all of them sit there to come and help investors. Yes. I always tell SMEs whenever I meet them, come to the one-stop center, the investment, si uh, investment license is free of charge. Uh. Apply for the investment license, uh -huh. and then once you, get, you have the investment license, all incentives which apply to the foreign investors, mm. uh, the so-called Chinese, Bazungu, mm. all those incentives, they the tax applied. holidays, mm. uh, the f uh, free movement of goods, the tax rebates, mm. they apply to you once you have the tax invest the investment license. So when I tell you that you come and enter into a joint venture mm. with an investor, an international investor, and uh, you come to Uganda Investment Authority, mm. and many of them come, I only tell you one thing, do you have an investment license? So that we can start from there. Mm. If you don't have, then I go. I take you downstairs, downstairs mm. where we have the one-stop center, and, we can and then it. we can work on that. Is there a possibility of someone applying for the investment uh, license online? Yes. Without coming to the offices? And uh, it's not, those I, tell, I take downstairs is because they've come to the office. The, yes. But the investment license is fully online. You don't have to come uh, with any hard thing. Wow. You just go to www.ebiz.co.ug. Wow. Then you fi fix in your, your the requirements. Usually they want you to have a, a, a certificate of incorporation, mm. your TIN number, and then uh, your memats, mm. and then you get the investment license. Please it's repeat the website for purposes it's of www.ebiz. Ebiz, it's spelled E B I Z. E B I Z. It's uh -huh. electronic business. Yes. Dot ebiz. Dot co. Ug. Wow. So you go there, you register everything, you get the Then investment. in 24 hours, you have your investment license. Wow. This is interesting. Top 100 SMEs of 2020. Now, you, my friend, if you're an investor and you're there watching NTV this afternoon, I want to excite you about this that is happening. Now, joining us is uh, Robert Wanok, who happens to be the head of personal and business banking from the DFCU Bank. Robert, if you can hear me. Okay, well, he can hear me. We will just proceed with the conversation. Now, coming back to you, Mr. Ofumbi, about all this that is happening, today you are our keynote speaker. And I, I want to engage you about um, the entire conversation, how SMEs can cope with the economic impact of COVID-19. From where you stand, what could be the best approaches to this? Uh, first and foremost, uh, when you look at the challenges that, the, uh, that most businesses are facing right now, Mm -hmm. uh, because first and foremost, um, we are having, uh, from the SME perspective, mm. costs are really going up oh, and yes. uh, the revenue is basically not coming through as yeah. uh, we anticipated. And uh, th there is a need to rethink uh, in terms of our strategies. Oh, yes. Whether it is a business model or whether it is a, uh, a way you do business, mm. it's important to rethink it.
uh -huh. uh, because gone are the days when we took a lot of things for granted. Uh -huh. uh, in, in the market, there were things that we took as alternatives, and they were available. Th today, back then. Yes, back yes. then. Mm. Uh, today, uh, there are not many alternatives, uh, oh, because yeah. SOPs have made uh, sure that there's a standard that has actually been built. Oh, yes. So um, if we had an alternative back then, it's no longer available today. Uh, when we look at our business models, um, mm. are we still relevant in the B2B market or B2C market mm -hmm. or B2B2C market? Mm. Where do we need to be going? What's our revenue model? Mm -hmm. um, because uh, internally what we have uh, discovered is that we can no longer uh, rely on our projections mm -hmm. or our past performance. We're now moving on a month by month basis. Mm -hmm. Our budgets are running on a month by month basis. Mm -hmm. And so when we have some payables, if we settle them this month, it means the next month, if we do have cash flow, we then actually settle them. Mm -hmm. Because that's a practical way of actually doing it. Oh, yes. Because uh, if you do not run a zero best budget right now, uh, you're probably living in a, in, in a different environment because the challenges are real. Um, revenue that we had taken for granted, uh, probably uh, post uh, pre-COVID, Mm. Today has basically fizzled. It just, it just ran away. It disappeared. Oh, yeah. So we, we need to rethink how we do a lot of things. Mm. And uh, some of the conversations we are really having um, around things like mergers mm. have uh, SMEs considered the fact that, uh, because the conversations we have include the fact that it's no longer me. Oh, yes. it's, it's now we. Oh, yes. Because they, it, it's now a conversation about survival more than it is about, okay, I started, I have yes. to continue, mm. and all this. Now it's about how do we survive? Oh, yeah. Because the, um, uh, when, when you think about it, uh, we are in all this, we're, we're all in this together. Mm. Uh, whether it is the supplier, whether it's the consumer, we're all being battered by the same uh, uh, environment mm. and the pandemic. Mm. So um, the question of about do I merge my business with my competitor mm -hmm. and we make a bigger and better business are conversations we are having right now. Mm. And uh, we are building a one-stop center to have that conversation because many people have uh, a lot of biases uh -huh. about, okay, so if I, I think about it, my... It, yes. If my vision doesn't align with your vision, yes. of course, as a business owner, yes. I could have some trust issues. Yes. Then if your financial discipline is is and if you're not compliant to the terms of Uganda Investment Authority, yes, I could have my fears. Yes, but wow. the 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 fact is, uh, gone are the days when we were thinking about a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, the conversations we're having with a lot of SMEs are like, I am at the point of survival, oh, yeah. and so if I need to survive, what are the alternatives I have to survive? To survive yes. And so this is the conversation that's actually happening, all the way from uh, real estate manufacturing and a host of others, wow. because. Uh, you can no longer do what you need to do back then because many of their um, savings are gone. Mm. Many of the investment activities are gone. Uh, many of uh, the things we relied on are oh no longer uh, mm. in existence. Mm. Uh, banks had to restructure a lot of facilities. Uh, new credit is uh, anywhere in between. Oh, yes. uh, supply chains have been disrupted. The way, they're no longer giving out loans so yes. fast. Like I don't know what's happening. <laughs> They're very tight. Yes. <laughs> Something Wanoke is going to explain to us. Yeah, because the reality is that uh, <coughs> unless, uh, because this money that the banks are giving out is from depositors. Oh, yeah. And they have a responsibility to actually return that, that money, money yes. to the depositors. Mm. And so if you appear like you're not able to actually return it, because mm -hmm. the most important part is can you actually service that facility? Oh, yeah. If you can't, then it's going to be a problem for them. And uh, they have a regulator who's going to knock down their head. They have oh, shareholders yeah. who are going to make demands. Mm. And definitely the whole environment. Because uh, one bank that goes down has a ripple effect on oh, the whole economy. There are quite many. Yeah. So oh. it's important that uh, people rethink their business models. Wow. Well, thank you so much. That is Oscar Ofumbi, the director of my SME, SME. Now joining us is Robert Wanok, the head of personal and business banking from the DFCU Bank. Good afternoon, Robert. It's good to have you again on the show. Good afternoon, Robert. Robert, can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chamagero. Good afternoon. Okay, finally, good have, you can hear me. Good to have you. Good to hear from you again. We, we were talking about something to do with money here and the, how banks a little bit, you know, I can hear you. holding on to their money. Uh, they, they're not giving out credit as it should be. From where you stand as DFCU Bank, what steps should firms, SMEs, rather undertake to cope up with the shocks of COVID-19? 
uh, especially looking at the reducing of the demand, uh, low productivity, cash flow challenges, liquidity, and the entire disruption. Robert? Robert, can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Wano, can you hear me? Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can, yes. It is loud and clear. I, I've, been listening, I've been listening in very keenly to... Yes, I can. Uh, I've been listening in quite... Okay. I've been listening in quite keenly on uh, the conversation from uh, the rest of the panelists. And uh, I think one of the things that comes to my mind is uh, a, a saying uh, by uh, a famous economist called John Maynard. And he said that uh, the difficulty lies not so much um, in the developing of new ideas, but uh, in as much as we can escape from our old ones. And I think what we are being faced with right now is uh, a reality that has actually come on the table. And uh, this new normal that we are dealing with right now, uh, for a businessman, for uh, an SME that's out there, the key things that uh, everybody else has been discussing about uh, really what we are all grappling with. And I think from a bank perspective, we've discussed this uh, a couple of several times. Uh, we've been able to categorize and we've looked at the risk of, uh, the risk of COVID from uh, two perspectives. We've looked at those farms that we are pretty sure will be able to uh, survive and get out in the immediate, in the short term. And I think we spoke about this last time the farms that within the next uh, 12 months will be able to jump out. And then we have the farms that we think will be able to recover after about two years. And we looked at uh, the ones that will be able to recover almost immediately. Agriculture has done extremely well as a sector. Uh, manufacturing looks like it's actually beginning to open up again and it's beginning to get back. Yeah? And uh, there are some professional services that are also looking um, on a medium scale, look like they can be able to bounce back. But certainly, there are some businesses that are taking a hit. If you look at education, uh, you look at transport uh, and logistics, you look at the tour and travel sector, the hospitality sector, those are sectors that we are seeing that will definitely have the challenge and take the hit home, even in the, uh, in the medium term, probably to the length of about uh, two to three years. So we've talked about a couple of things that, as a bank that we've been able to come through. And uh, we've spoken about um, the restructuring process that we've done for our SME customers. And by restructuring, I mean the offering of a moratorium to sort of delay uh, the immediate spend that a business needs to be making right now. And it's one of the key things that any business needs to be looking at right now. Uh, can you be able to look in the immediate and assess your business and take a really close look internally and analyze what is it that you can be able to delay from a spend perspective. Right now we advise most of our businesses, maybe it's not the right time to take a capital expenditure. Focus a lot more on your three to six month uh, expenditures, which is your OPEX, what we, what we normally call OPEX. Your operational expenditure is very aligned to what a bank would come out to actually come out and fund. And when we look at your operational expenditure, to stay afloat, the things that you need, you need stock, uh, you need working capital, uh, you need the daily things that will fuel your business to be able to open up and, do, and, and open your shop and do business. And uh, we, we took a poll. When we took a poll of uh, the business community and we asked the business communities, um, about uh, three weeks ago. So in that online poll, we asked, what would you look at as your immediate needs from a commercial bank? And 69% of the business community said they would need some form of business working capital. Yeah. Then there was another portion that said debt forgiveness, of course. I, 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 and and you're, you must be looking at me and wondering whether I am here to actually offer that solution. But there is a portion that actually said we would like some kind of debt forgiveness. But it is a, a very strange position that we all find ourselves in. But as a bank, we definitely are in a position to offer short-term working capital. And when we look at short-term, we're looking at within the next three to six months. 
to the one year. And any businessman logically would be looking at this and saying, what is it that I can do immediately to make sure that I keep afloat? Then the other one, of course, is uh, um, business advisory services. So as we offer your relief as a commercial bank, as we give our customers relief, uh, from a DFCU perspective specifically, we have different types of customers. So we have the customers, especially the ones that are in informal trade, the informal trader. And we have different advice that we would give from an informal trader to the larger business. So for the informal trader, for example, we have what we call a Baraka loan facility, which is totally unsecured. And as long as the SME has been keeping books and uh, can demonstrate that they can give, uh, give us some kind of collateral, uh, or uh, we would be able to give them up to 30 million shillings, but if they need anything above that, we can be able to give them still uh, that form of working capital, it, whether it's from in, in form of uh, securing, in form of a logbook, or uh, landed property, or uh, uh, pure land that you would have. That is, that is what we normally refer to as a chapa. Uh, we would be able to actually take that on. Then we also have the traders that, uh, or the contractors that have contracts that are running. So we would not want to uh, eliminate that sort of customer. So we have the trade uh, loans that we do offer of up to 500 million shillings. And this is really to make sure that we are relevant to the economy, but also relevant to the nature of business, that type of business that is involved in contracting, that might have a, a government contract, an office contract, that should be kept afloat. And we can guarantee you that we will give you that in five hours. Yeah, so up to 500 billion shillings. And there are those that will look for much more seeded capital greater than 500 billion shillings. And those two, uh, we are actually also having conversations. But I think the key thing for us right now is to be able to assess mm -hmm. and make sure that we uh, assist our customers take the right decisions and take them in the short term, mm -hmm. survive this period, and then begin to start looking at what the long term needs are. The other area, of course, from an advisory service that we would give you is we look at a customer and see whether you have a debtor's register. And we begin to start looking at your debtors. And we look at also your creditors. So you have debtors on one hand, uh, and you have the creditors, the ones that, that I would call Boba mm. Anja. Yeah? Mm. So we look at you and we say, OK, can we be able to fund you against your register of debtors, that your outstandings? And we also ask you, on your side, is there a way you can begin to start making the same analysis that a bank does on you, on those people, so that you can adequately make sure that they, are, they also keep afloat and not go under and oh, eventually yes. end up sinking you. Mm. So those are some of the things that we do. And uh, as a bank, we have uh, kept the promise that we will be here uh, to ensure that we are relevant to the development and the times of the economy. Mm. But I think... The times that we are in right now, our real uh, moment of truth is here. <laughs> so it's not something that is delayed that we can defer. Our right. moment of truth is here. We're beginning to see the real impacts of COVID. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is Renog. There is one thing you alluded to about the poll you took on uh, online. I participated in the poll, by the way. And um, one of my answers was capital because... A couple of very many young uh, entrepreneurs have come up with a lot of ideas but the biggest ones are the innovators. And it's something we need to, um, it's a conversation I'm still going to push as far as I can, how the banks can understand this new dispensation of the innovators. With DFCU Bank, how do we sail through with regards to the innovation vis-a-vis -vis the capital needed to start off? Robert? Okay, well, we'll get back to Robert a little later now. Coming back to I, I what think you say. I we have a bit of uh, a delay there. Oh, we had a delay. Okay, I'm not cool. sure if you can still hear me. Yes, I can, yes. But, Carry on. Um, yeah. So we, we do, uh, sorry about that. I think there's a bit of a delay in the sound and pickup, but uh, I think I've gotten you. You're, you're trying to understand how we can be able to push the agenda on uh, innovation and incubation. So we, we, we currently are running quite a number of incubations and uh, 
uh, and, and a couple of people have actually approached us, especially around the innovation side, because one of the key things that any business right now should be focusing on is what does it take for me to actually digitize my business? So we have, um, uh, we have an incubator that is currently running for our, agri especially our customers that are involved in agribusiness. And the agribusiness development center is really going out and conducting uh, basic courses for you to be able to uh, understand uh, from uh, data to uh, stock, to your creditors management, to the management of your assets over a period of time, crop cycle management across the different, uh, different crop cycles that we actually have. So we do have a team of specialists that is actually out there. So our business bankers, if you walked into any of our banking halls, our business bankers would be able to adequately guide you. We also do have uh, a team of specialist loan officers in our Greek that would be able to assist customers in that, in that drive. But I think the key thing right now that we are actually assessing and understanding from a distributor perspective, if you look at the real disruptions that have happened in the supply chains, if you look at what our customers need to be doing, a lot of customers need to start thinking about innovative ways of changing their distributor uh, cycles and their modes of distribution. And even in some instances, totally change your operating mode of business. But from a, a, a distribution perspective, one of the things that we're looking out for is, can you change your model to an online uh, receipting, to an online payment? So if, for example, you are previously offering uh, payments in, uh, in, form of, uh, in form of debt and you're offering credit to your customers, is there a way that you can channel and move into digital channels and innovative payment channels uh, like mobile money, uh, point of sale machines, uh, online payment through our apps, the various apps that we actually have. We have a very good app that is able to be able to organize your financials, but also enable you begin to start de-risking yourself from the risk of uh, offering out credit uh, to customers and move your business more towards a more cash uh, receipted sort of business, uh, but in an online form. So through the app, through the DFCU uh, uh, app, you would be able to make sure that your customers are able to pay you instantly, whether it's through card or through the online channels or through mobile, yeah? Then the other area is really for you to be able to manage uh, payments online and be able to view and make sure that you're able to take a stock of whoever's paid you and be able to release goods real time and do whatever you need to do from the confines of your home. And we've seen different businesses. We've seen a business that has actually moved uh, a laundry business that has moved from previously where I used to have to come to the shop to do my laundry. Now they come in with those three wheelers and pick up their la my laundry from home and I'm able to make my payments online and settle and they will still deliver back to me upon uh, completion of my laundry. And that has happened across all chains, whether it's in the food side, we've seen people move uh, restaurants into online delivery, uh, uh, we've seen uh, online apps come up. Um, we have these, they're very popular online apps now that are coming in, like Akatale, that come in and enable you to do all your shopping online without necessarily going out into the shop and doing uh, physical shopping. But somebody's going to come in and make sure that you have delivery done at your footstep. Thank you so much. That is Renok Robert, the head of... Uh personal and business banking. When he speaks, you can clearly listen to a lot of business going on. Uh, coming to you, uh, Basile, whatever he has said makes a lot of sense from where I stand as a youth and who believes in innovation. And um, he has alluded to quite a lot of things that I I'm going to take you bit by bit. But from your perspective, what technological developments have that have been made by your ministry or that are already in place that can help SMEs um, to resource and manage what they have better? One, for survival, two, for sustainability, and three, for growth. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Mm. Uh, Quite a number of technologies have come, not necessarily developed only by the ministry, mm. but also within the ecosystem of innovation. We support innovators who are doing different types of technology, and then it should be adopted by SMEs. Mm. I can give a few examples. Please. Oh, one of them is uh, there's an ICT application that helps <coughs> the entrepreneurs to manage their stock. Mm. Because, you know, SMEs come and say, today I've brought uh, goods ABCD. 
-hmm. and you have your book there where you record and you keep selling. But you can't precisely at any point in time know the reorder point. Mm -hmm. You don't know the stock levels. But now there's this application where you, 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 you pay some little money and then once you, you stock in, you enter. Mm -hmm. Actually like an application used in the, in the supermarkets, but a lower version oh. for an SME. Every time you make a sale, all you pick from the self is deducting. So mm -hmm. you can precisely know that I brought this number of kilograms of, 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 of sugar or this number of tons of salt or this number of tons of, 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 of um, rice, mm. at this very point in time, knowing the speed at which people buy this particular product, I need to reorder. That's one. There are lots <coughs> of applications in the medical field. There are, there are people who have developed technologies where you can actually test malaria. Mm. This is uh, in Barra universities. Mm. There, are, there are SMEs we supported, a group of young men. You actually go and then you scan and then you test whether they are positive or negative mm. malaria. Lots of uh, technology related to, there are actually many people coming with drones. We have been talking about a group of young sharp men who are trying to, to test the, the micro pollutants actually mm. in water. They're developing yes. the drones. Mm. But remember that needs sort of approval from Ministry of Science, from mm. Ministry of Internal Affairs, mm. from Ministry of Water. And now we're working with them. So when, when you have water, you are able to detect using a software to see oh that yes. these are the pollutants that you have. Mm. There's a technology which is uh, we can actually detect the food nutrients. You have a plate of food and then you just wave and it tells you you have this amount of carbohydrates, amount of proteins, wow. you know, the lipids. So it's good because we're becoming also sensitive in the oh food yes. that we eat. Yeah, true. That technology out <coughs> there, there's a boy who was trying to... There are quite a number of things that actually is mm. coming out and we're supporting. And there are people who are doing uh, bioengineering because uh, <coughs> you know that from the syringe to needles, to everything in the medical field, mm -hmm. we have been importing. But we're encouraging a group of engineers, the bioengineers, and we're saying no. The syringes, the needles, and the, th the gloves, mm. the surgical equipment, the PPEs, all that actually we are promoting, and it should be, in the next uh, few years, should be able to, to, to access it from Uganda. And there are a lot of research still related to, to that, not necessarily only technologies. Oh, yes. Uh, in the difficult time of COVID, uh, we assembled a team of scientists who are doing research in various areas. They are people who are doing research on different vaccines. Because we are talking about, uh, <coughs> we are talking about the COVID. We mm -hmm. are, the, our scientists are actually at the level of testing the compliance of how effective the vac vaccines which are developed locally can, can work. But in the, in, in the livestock sector or in the veterinary sector, there are quite a number of uh, vaccines which are also being tested. And mm. this can equally be applied uh, during the COVID time. So lots of technologies actually is coming out mm. and lots of researches are coming out, which actually solves the real-time problems of the entrepreneurs. Wow. Yes. Um, well, coming now to you, uh, Eria, from Uganda Investment Authority, what opportunities and incentives are available to SMEs to encourage them to do more production in Uganda, especially under the Uganda Investment Authority? Uh, Andrew, like I told you, the incentives apply all investors, uh -huh. but not necessarily specifically for SMEs. Uh -huh. So if an SME comes and he wants uh, an incentive, it depends on the value of the investment he's putting in. Uh -huh. We have tax incentives. Uh -huh. uh, those ones are tax holidays, tax rebates, uh -huh. and these ones are within the URA mandate, but UIA is the one to give you the investment license to qualify. Uh -huh. Then, of course, the East African, com the East African Common Market pr Protocol specifies certain incentives. Those are tax-based. Mm. But then even government now is giving out to SMEs land. Ah. Land for where they can do their investments In the industrial from. parks? In the industrial we parks. We still have some around Kampala. We have to go to Nagasaki. We ex we're expanding the industrial park in Namave, but yeah. uh, the one in Weogere is, and uh, the one in Ruzira mm. are basically occupied by SMEs. Okay. And uh, then uh, we also have uh, workspaces because now government has gone to creating workspaces for SMEs because we knew that, for example, people working in uh, Katwe mm. and uh, those uh, ghetto areas, they were so squeezed and they are, they are in hard to reach places. Mm. So government is now centralizing their workspaces. We are wow. constructing now 5,000 in, Nama, in Namave. Mm. Uh, we are going to put up for where they are going to be having shared machinery. Uh, you want to do to choose, you get the way you can, you can make all your shared things. Mm. Then also government is also now what is doing, they are opening up markets mm -hmm. for these SMEs. Uh, yeah, these top 100 SMEs know that uh, every year we take them to the East African 
uh, exhibitions Expo, mm. exposed around the, uh, the East African region where they showcase and learn from their fellow SMEs in the region. Mm. So those are some of the incentives we give, but uh, most of these incentives, like I've told you before, you must be a licensed investor to qualify for them. Mm. So the, all the adjunct colony SMEs, because most of the problem most SMEs are having and the problem you're having them is their inform the nature of the informality. Mm. We need them to formalize, we need them to license, we need them to be come on, be compliant and come on the world stage because mm. where they are going, the market they, they are competing with, mm. these are people who are compliant and uh, these are people who are formal, highly formal. Mm. So for them to do that, they have to come and we license them. Well, that is uh, Mr. Eria Kawirekuga. He happens to be a senior investment executive from the Uganda Investment Authority. Just so you know, if you want to know what he's talking about, something called the Uganda, uh, rather the investment license, log on to www.ebiz. Ebiz is E, B for boy, I for investor, Z for zebra, dot co dot ug. When you go there, you fill up whatever information you need and please be compliant. If you don't formalize and you're not compliant, you can't actually uh, get this. So you are one of those. Please just log on to there. So when we come back in the next hour, please make sure you bring your question. The hashtag is top, SME, top 100 SMEs at 20. That is on Twitter and on Facebook. And you're going to have a call in. You can call in and you ask your question either to the SME a guru, that is uh, Oscar, or to the Ministry of uh, Science, Technology and Innovation, or from the Uganda Investment Authority. The lines will be open. You call in, you ask your question. And even the questions you ask online, please don't abuse, don't castigate, ask investment questions. We'll take a break and we'll be back shortly. Uh, 100 SMEs uh, 2020 and we are live from Kampala Serena Conference Center. I'm Andrew Chiamagero and today on site I have uh, Mr. Oscar G. Ofumbi, the director of uh, My SME and we have Mr. Robert Wenok, the head personal and business banking that is in the DFCU Bank. We have Mr. Eria Kawireku, uh, he happens to be a senior investment executive from the Uganda Investment Authority and I have the director Basile Ja from the Ministry of Science and Technology and Science, Technology and Innovation. He's a techpreneurship director, my friend. <laughs> and if you're one of those joining this conversation, the hashtag is top 100 SMEs at 20. We'll be getting your questions a little later and you're going to call in. The number will be on the screen in the next few minutes and then we're still going to have this conversation. Coming back to you, Mr. Ofumbi, let's talk about teleworking. This thing of working at home, um, when everything came through, and I understand that you came up with a home learning uh, platform, uh, especially to, to cater for the students who are not going to school. And we have what they call home office. Yes. Many of these directors were not working in office <laughs> uh, when COVID had just come through. Yes. How has this been a necessary practice for many farms and workers during the lockdown um, in the crisis? Now, my biggest question is, are the farms adequately prepared to maximize the benefits from this practice of tele, uh, teleworking? Well, uh, I believe we are not ready. Mm. But the, the bigger question is, um, if COVID stays with us uh, two to three years down the mm. road, we will be forced to be ready because we have to survive. Uh, because when you look at the <coughs> a typical SME, mm. We have shared resources. We Indeed. have our, um, uh, desktops that are shared mm -hmm. within. Then we equally have uh, maybe one or two pieces of uh, uh, equipment uh, and the laptops. Yep. Our, um, uh, our landlines are equally fixed. And so I in order for us to do the, um, uh, the teleworking or working from home, we have to consider um, buying new equipment. And uh, for example, if I have 10 staff and I have to give them equipment to work, I'm uh, probably going to have to buy 10 or 20 uh, laptops. And mm. if each one is uh, another 30 million or 3 million shillings, we're probably going to end up in another 30 million for 10 of those. Then I'll have to provide uh, internet, uh, maybe 1 GB uh, a day, depending mm. on uh, the intensity of the work that they have to do. Mm. And so um, this easily becomes the most expensive way of doing business. And um, there is also the challenge of the culture. Um, in terms of where we're coming from, Mm. Uh, our culture hasn't been uh, about working from home. We thrive on people. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so true. Have you ever thought of, uh, hypothetically, yeah. have you ever thought of you waking up in a day and you're going to talk to Andrew via Zoom and you're going to have this conference on Zoom? Really? <laughs> you understand that yes. kind of feel? Because yes. we thrive on people. Um, the levels of adaptation, that swing flop from, it seems to be a little bit heavy. Yes, it is. Mm. Uh, because uh, today, if you talked about working from home, when does the day start and when does it actually end? And uh, okay. so uh, you have a situation where, uh, for example, if you're dealing with a lot of companies that, uh, for example, you're doing business with them, mm. uh, the decision making has already been disrupted oh, yes. uh, in terms of approval. Mm. So, for example, somebody, uh, an approver is offline. Mm. So, um, God help you if you have to collect <laughs> payments from that company. Oh, yes. Because what should have happened in weeks is now taking uh, a lot longer than that. Oh, yes. And so, uh, this is already uh, affecting the, the cash flows of uh, businesses yes. and the way we ordinarily uh, do business. Yes. So, um, the impact of teleworking, uh, unless uh, we have to do it, mm. it's, it's really quite a challenge for uh, many SMEs. Coming to you, Basil, what he's saying is saying it's, it's, it's a little bit... It, it, it's a long journey we are going to walk. If it is to freedom with technology, it's something that's going to take us long. Using the same aspect he's using, can you dive us into our digital strategy as a nation with the internet connectivity and where we are today? Well, uh, the digital strategy, uh, you know, we, we in the NDP3, mm -hmm. we, we left the sectors and we have gone to what is called the programs. Mm -hmm. So NDP3, we in previously you talk about the sector, science, technology, innovation sector, the digital sector, and different mm. sector. Now it's a program. The program that we are actually championing as a minister, which we are spearheading, is called innovation, program, uh, innovation technology development, and transfer. Mm -hmm. But in there, there are aspects of digitalization of government. We have experienced in the recent time that... Uh, universities and primary schools are now using the digital approach to trying to know handle the situations at hand. Mm. Uh, a good example are a few schools in Kampala who are actually now accessing students or their pupils from home using mm. the digital approach. Universities like Makerere, Chambog, the finalists are coming back and people are trying to organize examination mm. which is online. Government has uh, adopted the process of digitalization in many aspects. If you look at uh, from public service, right from recruitment. You don't actually have to now put your application physically by filling that hard form, mm. which is called the PSC 3 form 5. Oh, yeah. you, you <laughs> physically. Go, yeah, you go online, you apply, yeah. they shortlist you, they call you for interviews. Mm. In the payroll management, there are a lot of improvement that has taken place mm -hmm. in the digital strategy. In agricultural sector, you know, still again we are talking about drones. Mm. digital agriculture there's a lot of support in, 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 in those areas and so many other sectors but it goes beyond digitalization if you're mm. looking at the whole program of innovation uh, uh, technology development and transfer we talk about digitalization then you need to look at uh, infrastructure development I mentioned mm. something about science and technology park mm. technology business betas yes. high class laboratories we can support and that's important the next component that is very, very useful is uh, research and innovation program support. Mm. Government has put in place some money which should support research and innovation. And as a ministry, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, this financial year, we have 10 billion Uganda shillings that mm. should support the different innovators, mm. right from startups to academic research to you know, all types of innovation. We should support the different SMEs. And there's a few examples of technologies that I was talking about here. Uh, have been supported using the innovation fund. Mm. It started small with 10 billion, but we hope that the amount will increase as time goes in the subsequent years, and that has been important. Another key aspect that we're emphasizing now is intellectual property rights. Because nice. that's where we are. Young men or young ladies out there, people are busting with ideas. People are coming with several new ideas every other day. But also experience has shown that uh, when you go to international conferences, you are, you are asked to present your ideas, mm. you have to share your concept, because they are robust, they are well developed, eventually they move fast and develop your idea. Well developed robust. Yes, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the ministry actually has a department called uh, Department of uh, Innovation and Intellectual Property, mm. 
when these guys come, we talk to them and said, you have a great idea, but we want to walk you through the process of protecting your work. The information, idea. the idea. Mm. So there are many forms of uh, intellectual uh, property protection, but most times when you talk about intellectual property rights, people think about patents. Mm. But there are similar versions. Mm. You can actually, if you cannot do any of those, mm. try to keep a secret. Mm. When you're keeping a secret, it's risky because if Andrew learns in read, you're in. I, I'm going to run with it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the best you can actually just uh, trademark. Mm. You can do the the design protection and mm. many others. So intellectual property is something which is very important and we are encouraging people not to ignore that mm. and delve into that. Director, before you leave the issue yes. of intellectual property here, um, many people have very many ideas mm. and you know they have their reservations, that's why they, they mm. don't want to open up to the mm. government entities, especially mm. government. Mm. They feel either they're going to be suppressed with their ideas mm. Or someone is just going to run with it and amplify it in on an industrial scale mm. that you can't even claim it even if it ever comes out. Mm. So how are their ideas protected? What's the process like? Um, because I strongly believe you believe in open source kind of yes. technologies. Yes, yes. Uh, given that you believe in the open source kind of technologies, how protected are these ideas? How long does the process take? Now, uh, the rec recently there's uh, the the IPR policy which was passed by yes, government. Yes. And you'll appreciate that the process of protecting, not, not, all, not all information is uh, protectable. Oh, yes. For example, you cannot come and say, um, I'm using, what has been known in the community as an indigenous knowledge, it is and it's common knowledge, mm. you cannot come and protect. Mm. That is for the common good, it's for everybody. Yes. But when you come with an idea, we have scientists in the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation who will try to verify the information because mm. there's a database of all the ideas which is protected. Nice. This is kept by WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Mm. So we look through for the uniqueness because by the time you're protecting, something should be unique, which has oh, come yes. from you. Mm. Look for the uniqueness, then they help you to write it up, and you walk through the process, mm. you're testing. It is you to keep the information. You don't give to everyone. We just give you the steps and processes. Mm. So we do the technical processes. But then the registration of intellectual property is done by Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Nice. So we do the technical aspects, walking you through the journey. Mm. Once you're prepared and we are sure it is okay, mm. then we send you to Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Government does not, uh, or in particular I can talk about Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. It is our work to protect and support the innovators. Mm. but not to no, to rip off their ideas and then we take it out. We have actually been moving out and telling these young men and ladies that any idea that you come with, you need to protect. In, uh, in other countries, once it's protected, it takes uh, 20, 25 years. But in Uganda, once your idea is protected, you use it for 20 years. Be beyond 20 years, we believe that you have gotten both the economic returns and all other benefits. Mm -hmm. And people can now use it. It becomes like common good, common for knowledge. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's like uh, a paper which is published in the journal. People should use the knowledge. Somebody may want to improve on what you have. So after oh, yes. 20 years, then it's open. Mm -hmm. But it's something which is very important and should encourage people to appreciate. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. We're having conversations about the top SMEs. If you're an innovator and you would love to plug into that, these are great brains in studio here today and that they're tremendously giving us opportunities. Coming back to you, Mr. Edia, what is government doing to encourage local content standardization and make sure that Ugandan products are more attractive? both in Uganda and outside. Let me first bring you fast forward. Earlier, the nation is watching. When you go to a supermarket and you find ketchup and top up, what do you buy? Uh, ketchup, I usually use uh, <coughs> top up. Mm. And what Edia, was, the world is watching. What was the other one? <laughs> <laughs> ketchup and top up. Of the two, what do you take? I use top up. You use top up? Yeah. Why? Is it because you buy Uganda, build Uganda? Exactly. It's by nature. Okay. <laughs> if it wasn't that, would you still do <coughs> buy that? I just love the application. You just, I love, just love the automata sauce. Okay. What is Uganda doing? What's the government doing through Uganda Investment Authority to one about local content, uh, to encourage local content and standardization and to make sure that our products uh may I be honest with you, mm. I always take ketchup. Because at times I look at the the product of, of your brand. Okay. That it's a little bit wanting. Mm. The packaging is is, is 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 a little bit below the belt. At times, the expiry date, they use pens to write, and I can't be so certain. 
So um, what is government doing about that, that we, even the locals, can have confidence in buying these products? All right. Um, first of all, uh, all SMEs, what we are telling them is that uh, we are encouraging them to get the Q-mark. Nice. The Q-mark, that mm. is the quality mark quality from uh, mm. UNBS. Mm. But even then, we have now the standards labs, mm. which have been developed. There's one in Imbarara, there's one in uh, Boyogere. Mm. I think there's even one at Yuri. Mm. Mm. We are encouraging SMEs to get their products and put, because the ISO is an international. Indeed. So uh, for you, when you tell me that uh, your ketchup is better than my top up, when mm. it has gone through the lab, yeah. they have the same ingredients and they are marked up. Okay. But before and beyond that is that uh, we are, we are now seeking for patriotism and we have to be as a nation. we have to love our country mm. so as a uganda investment authority as government of uganda we've developed what we call the local content bill mm -hmm. uh, actually it was passed by parliament it's awaiting the president to assent to it whereby we are encouraging that everywhere government uses money or you use government resources 40 mm. percent should be local be it furniture they want in offices. Forty percent should be local. Nice. We learned this from uh, the oil and gas sector, but mm. now we want to, uh, to accelerate it to other sectors, mm. whereby we put up a national re register, mm. a national service providers register, mm. and then we encourage everyone who comes and bids for a government contract or to utilize our resources, natural resources, you must involve a local company or a local person, mm -hmm. be it uh, in employment, be it in uh, contracting everywhere. So that is the local content uh, bill. So once the president passes it, it will be a must that uh, once you get a contract, uh -huh. for example, to develop a road, uh -huh. let me say the Jinja Express Highway, mm. you are Chinese, 40% of the contract should mm. be taken over <coughs> by the, local, SM, right by the local companies. How ready are the SMEs to the standards that they want to meet? Because these are international contracts we're talking about yeah. here. And they're national contracts. How ready are the SMEs to the standards to meet this kind of demand? Okay, our, um, many SMEs might not be ready mm. uh, because um, they, uh, I'll go back to the oil and gas um, excitement. Mm. We participated in that excitement. We are still waiting for the oil, yes. my friend. <laughs> and uh, that was when Talo was still Talo. Oh, yes. Uh, and we Sinok was still in the mix. Yes, Sinok mm. had even, even come into Uganda. Oh, yes. Um, we engaged their, um, an, an ISO uh, practitioner, a mm. consultant, mm. and we developed all the manuals and uh, mm. everything's available, uh, gathering some dust nice. in the offices. <laughs> uh, but the, the challenge came from the fact that um, at which point do you actually engage of course, there's a lot that has happened since then. Uh, there's yes. now a national supplier database. There's mm. uh, um, local content has come through. A lot of improvements have come along. Yes. But um, uh, most SMEs uh, come from that point of we invested earlier into some of these things, yes. but we did not see the fruit of uh, this investment. Yes. And now, um, the, uh, because Talo Oil sent out uh, almost, what, three, four different it consultants. Kept dragging. Yes, and, uh, and, and that disincentivized uh, many of us that had earlier invested. Mm -hmm. And so uh, many SMEs are saying, okay, uh, if at all it happens, we will wait for that time when it actually happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that becomes a problem because uh, the expectation is that you are ready Mm. for the opportunity mm. so the uh, usual chicken and egg is really going to have to <laughs> oh, yes. uh, come into play here oh, yes. uh, but uh, i believe the most important thing is that uh, in, the, in the environment that we are in right now the, mm. the covid and the host of others mm. uh, people are rethinking uh, what they uh, what they need to be doing mm. uh, what opportunities should we be uh, chasing or what opportunities will actually uh, crumble down to us because mm. when we go back to the basics of economics uh, mm. the demand and supply oh yes if the products that you are producing or services today are not actually in demand should you actually continue <laughs> to produce them <laughs> just get out of, <laughs> yeah, get out of that <laughs> so um, the uh, uh, many of the uh, SMEs mm. that have considered Mm. or thought about uh, getting involved in, uh, in contracts of that nature mm. um, uh, are finding it quite difficult to move uh, into whichever direction. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of uh, offices that have had to be closed. We have a lot of dreams that have actually Being had to be, yes, we shattered so completely. Mm. And uh, uh, before COVID, we used to um, laugh about uh, the uh, briefcase companies. Mm. But uh, with yeah, the very COVID, practical today. we are now having more <laughs> briefcase companies. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Oscar. Let me just drop this to Richard um, uh, Wanok uh, from the DFCU Bank. Uh, well, Robert, from your perspective, uh, Elias touched a very sensitive topic here, something to do with standardization. 
You as the bankers, as the credit facilitators for all these, do you think SMEs are ready to meet the standards of what the international market demands or the national standards demands? If so, what can be done to make sure that they can run the race where the rubber meets the tarmac and we're good to run as a nation? Uh, thank you, Andrew. And, and, and I, I, I want to uh, really uh, say that I think the conversation about buy Uganda, build Uganda is a very necessary one for us very to be able so. to sustain mm. uh, the economy and mm. really get us to that point where we can actually begin to start seeing poverty levels change and seeing our SMEs actually gradually grow. Now, when you look out and ask what the biggest uh, requirement that most people uh, come out and say, what does it take to get Ugandans to actually begin to start participating? We are very entrepreneurial in nature, and uh, I think you, you can see the statistics for yourself. Uh, the average Ugandan has a very good knack for starting a business. Somehow, somewhere there, we tend to uh, really stick into the informal even for businesses that really have the potential to grow and grow and really expand, uh, they've, they've somehow sort of stagnated. And some of them have stagnated either as family businesses or uh, where what we normally call a man-dominated corporate. The company has grown, but it is still highly dependent on the individual as, uh, as, uh, the, the, as, as the entrepreneur is the alpha and omega in the business. Now, what we actually are seeing increasingly is how do we challenge these businesses to actually move up to the next level and begin to start looking at uh, continuity and survival and move actually past survival and get into a growth trajectory that they can be able to bid uh, and competitively bid. It requires for them to be able to set up systems. They need to have the right structures. They need to be able to pay taxes and demonstrate that they can pay taxes. They need to be able to employ uh, the right professionals to be able to get certain works done. And all that is encompassed into what, uh, Andrew, you just defined as how can we assist them with standardizing. Because you will not be uh, the specialist. Uh, you're the pilot. You want to be the, uh, uh, well, I think the pilot might be a bad example, but you, you want to be the entrepreneur that is doing road construction, keeping the books, employing, um, administration. Uh, you're the one who hires and fires. You find it that at some point you're going to actually break down. So what we do uh, as a bank, and uh, we've been embedded, DFCU has been embedded in the last 50 plus years of this economy very, very, very deeply in the development of the, uh, uh, of, of the, of the uh, business economy or, and, the, and the whole environment around setting up of businesses and seeing them actually run, even in very tough areas that many people would go away and run away from, like transport and logistics. So if you look at the oil story, like Andrew, you've just described, the oil story of the initial people that went in and uh, when the initial conversations began, I think about 2013, 2015 there, around uh, will the final investment decision be coming out soon, you'll see a lot of entrepreneurs run in there. And now you actually see a lot of them are stuck with bank date. But many banks actually shied away from those investments and getting into those areas. But we got in there. And as a bank, we've continuously found ourselves getting into areas where we need to, where many, many bankers would shy. And one of the things that has helped us out and what we are trying to also sell on to businessmen is the concept of insurance. As a bank, we have gone out and partnered with some, um, some people that have been able to come up and say we'll insure uh, in very difficult and uh, tough uh, uh, natures of business like uh, agriculture. And many people ask you, why are you involved in agriculture? We actually believe that uh, agriculture is the biggest employer to the economy. And so we've been able to identify partners and insurers who have come in there and they've done things like crop insurance. And we've been able to see this country. This country today is the second largest producer on dairy. We have beaten Kenya to the number two producing country in Africa. We are now number two. And we want to believe that we have been part of that success story. The other area is in things like beef production, uh, cattle fattening, you know, 
uh, the whole story around um, uh, uh, cereals. You know, th these are areas that you find a lot of other banks would have shied away from, but we've come into there because we've also been enabled by people that have come in to insure. The other area for us is the women. And if you look at the amount of, even within the current COVID setup, one thing that has come out very clearly is that women owned businesses have actually continued to wither and they've thrived. And it is based on the stability of women as entrepreneurs or even by nature in their DNA is a factor of stability and you can see it. Now, we have also been able to partner with uh, some insurers who have come in and said, we will take on the risk in women-owned businesses. So we have what we call a women in business unit within mm. DFCU. Mm. And people can come out and begin. If you're a woman entrepreneur, please do come out and reach out to us. We will take the risk in your business. Mm. Then the other one that you're going to see us now get into, given that now we have that aspect of insurance, we want to now take the risk in startups. One of the things that Uganda is not so good is keeping okay. businesses afloat. A lot of, you've seen the statistics for yourself, Andrew. Mm -hmm. A lot of our businesses will not see the day of light into a second anniversary. Oh, yes. They don't live past that anniversary. So within 2021, one of the things that you'll see us doing is taking a risk into some novel business areas that mm -hmm. are considered as startups. And that means a very strong tie in with an incubator, with uh, an innovation hub. Mm -hmm. that would be able to come in and be able to direct us and show us into very good areas that we can be able to get into. And I think the economy has been digitized enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be able to track right from registration of a company all the way to coming up and uh, uh, setting up an account. Mm -hmm. You can be able to actually do all this online, to doing your bookkeeping, to having a lot of your payments and your cycles actually administered through a bank without necessarily even ever coming and having to walk into uh, my premises, <laughs> uh, including payment of your taxes. Oh, you, yes. you no longer need to uh, walk to URA to, mm. to, to, to conduct your tax payments. Indeed. But what is it that we need to do? I think we, we need to focus a lot on getting the mindset of our business people into getting into the formal work stream. So that, okay. that way, then we can actually say that this buy Uganda, sell Uganda, buy Uganda, build, build Uganda, Uganda story yeah. is actually going to grow and we will be able to get into the oil and gas sector, we'll be able to get into the construction, we'll be able to take over uh, the f and become a proper food basket for the region mm -hmm. and go out and not just have middlemen come and buy and take, take. Uh, the, the, the produce <coughs> from us, but have Ugandans go out and competitively go and mm -hmm. take over the regional trade uh, arena. Thank That's, you so much. Yeah. That, that is Robert. Robert, hang in there. Um, coming back to you, it all started from you and it spilled. I wanted to first say what the SM is, if they were ready and the creditor, was the creditor ready? Now back to you. Um, what is government doing to make sure that our products are attractive and to meet those standards? So, um, Andrew, beyond the local content bill, after putting up the local content bill and we encourage SM is, mm. the, the, and we finish SM is partaking this. Mm. Then we encourage them to do the buy Uganda, build Uganda. Okay. But now we've, it's actually now spiraling beyond the buy Uganda, build Uganda because we are in the East African uh, market now. They are saying buy U East Africa, build East Africa. Mm. But the, on the buy Uganda, build <coughs> Uganda, the issue is that we are encouraging our fellow citizens, and it comes back to the patriotism I've told you, the oh ketchup yes. story. Mm. That stop <laughs> eating ketchup, come and buy to <laughs> top up so because. Uh, You'll be, you'll be employing a Ugandan, you'll oh, yes. be uh, feeding a Ugandan, mm. and you'll be paying the taxes to Uganda. Mm. Then when you get that mix local content, you buy Uganda, build Uganda, then your issues of quality start coming in. Mm. Government is saying, okay, we are putting up the f infrastructure, the okay. laboratories. Mm. Uh, my brother here, they have, they have Yuri. Yuri is doing the intubation. Mm. They are doing the product testing, the product development at Uganda. Very beautiful work down there at URI. Mm. Then after that, government now says, what more does the SME want? Mm -hmm. We have what we call the reservation schemes. In that certain areas are for Ugandan SMEs. Because mm -hmm. when I tell you, uh, that f for instance, when you look at Karuma, mm. Karuma Dam, uh, which is being built, and I tell you that all the steel <coughs> came from steel and tube and roofings. Mm. Those, these are Ugandans. 
steel and tube and roofing still supplied the, the steel which built the ginger dam. I actually, for Karuma, um, I went there myself to confirm the consignments. There was one. Then I was there to confirm if the entire fleet of workers were locals. And I confirmed that 78% uh, were Ugandans. So when it gets to this UN ground. So that was, that's what we're doing. Now, mm. after doing the reservation schemes, then we start saying, uh, the fellow, our fellow SM is now, what more do you want us to do? Wow. So now those are the questions we are here for the top 100 to give mm. us what more do you want government to do for you? Because I've, have, I've, I've broken down whatever government has done. <laughs> now it's now government demanding you, why don't you create employment? <laughs> because we, when you create employment, our people are working. And yes. we, when our people are working, we are mm. sure of the taxes and our economy will grow. You're going to respond to that. Back to you, uh, uh, Mr. Basil, Director. You wanted to comment about the standardization and the product um, amplification? Yes, I, I think uh, the question is how do we support the SMEs to meet the standards? Mm. Uh, let's look at both internal and external. Look at the whole ecosystem. Oh, yes. What should be done by the SMEs themselves? Mm. We are trying to accelerate. He's saying we need to get Q max. Mm. We need to improve on efficiency. You know, when mm. you're looking at efficiency triangle, you're looking at your cost. You're looking at uh, quality, you're looking at time, mm. improve, on <coughs> improve on your quality, mm -hmm. leverage on technology to reduce the cost. Because if your cost is high, because we're now going to a, a global village, you will not be able to, to compete. Mm. Do lots of innovation in the processes, in, in the products, in the marketing, so that you are able to access new set of customers. Mm. Because if you don't do enough of innovation, you remain with the old technologies, but people are moving very far. You need to innovate in the processes, you need to innovate in the types of products that is coming out, mm. which is actually in sync with the, the customers that we have marketing, and you're able to access new sets of uh, customers. Nice. But from the external side, in terms of the policy environment from government, I think uh, COVID has also given us opportunities. Government is emphasizing now issues around import substitution. Mm. That's sure. actually the policy. Government is saying we're going to do everything possible to stimulate production of local, you know, local products using our available raw materials. That is why if you look at, uh, he's talking about the tax incentive, but if you, if you look at the, the pronouncement that comes from the Minister of Finance, especially during budget speech, oh, yes. he's targeting particular sectors. Recently, see that there has been <coughs> a tax on, on, on Jews, imported Jews. Oh, yes. I think it's about 60%. Mm. Uh, you are talking about cement, which is used for supplying a caroma. Mm. It's a specific import duty when mm. you are bringing uh, the tiles. A good example is ceramics. The tiles, this mm. one in, uh, in Kapeka. Kapeka. Mm. There was a deliberative effort. We mm. went down and said, how much can you pro What is our demand for us as a country? Mm. And what is your capacity? And we what can good. we do? We so the tiles in, yeah, in, in, I, I yeah it's in very Congo. good. Yeah, there mm. was a tax which is put on, import tax which is put on that, and supporting, stimulating the local industry. I mm. think both from the policy environment and, and also internal to the SME, mm. we all now have a common direction that we need to innovate, mm. we need to improve on our standards, mm. and that speaks to the import, substi you know, the wow. import substitution, mm. which is very useful. There is no better time than now, in my view. Both so inclusion from all levels is, from all is levels. patent. Yeah. Well, now this brings us to the question... <coughs> that came from the Uganda Investment Authority. What more do you SMEs need from government? Because they have given you reservation schemes, they have given you 50 plus um, research, world scientifically research business models that can work. They have given you avenues where you can just log on and you get an investor license and you get all these other um, benefits that come with it. What more do SMEs need? Okay. Our, um, well, it's a uh, common secret uh -huh. uh, that uh, to access anything from government, mm. uh, you must uh, make sure that uh, whoever is responsible yes. uh, is uh, managed. Uh -huh. And so um, uh, these are challenges that uh, we have in terms of access. Okay. And uh, as an SME, the uh, question usually is that, okay, so who do you know or who do you need to know mm. to actually access some of those other things? Uh, I like when um, they, they state that uh, everything's available online and uh, the uh, information that will be needed is actually it's online, yes, yes. online. Mm. And, uh, well, there's always a test mm. to that uh, activity. Oh, yes. And uh, so the test will basically uh, tell, like you say, <laughs> time will tell uh, whether uh, this, is, this is where it actually uh, mm. is. But I, I believe that uh, their efforts are welcome. Mm. And uh, I believe that... Um, uh, the more we engage mm. and we get forums mm. 
mm. we will be able to um, nice. articulate much more. Perfect. Um, they are different. Uh, working with the Uganda Small Scale uh, Association, mm. um, we we had we have an engagement as a Save My SME with them, mm. and they have um, over twenty clusters. Nice. And and so each cluster has uh, their own unique sort of demands, mm. uh, as it were, or the, their own questions that they would wish to uh, sort of uh, have ironed out. Mm. But um, as Ugandans, uh, we are extremely enterprising. Mm. In spite of all the challenges that we find ourselves, we are continuing mm. to uh, continue to do business. And uh, so there is a category of SMEs that say, okay, uh, anything to do with government, um, happy, I will not mm. actually deal with. But wh why is that mindset? Because it's, it's exactly what uh, Wanok was alluding to earlier. Yes. He said we need a mindset shift among yes. some SME business owners. Yes. That trust, how do we bridge back the trust now? Okay. Uh, the, the trust really come from uh, the fact that the rubber must meet the road. The term, yes. And, and so if uh, we, we can always say all good things, mm. we can uh, um, propose a, a lot of things that uh, would, would be helpful. Mm. But when it finally comes to the actual implementation, how much of it can we uh, achieve? Mm. How much of it can we take as benefit as uh, SMEs? Mm -hmm. Because um, you'll find that there are many SMEs that are, are, are crying out. Uh, we know the story about the domestic debt. Oh, yes. And uh, th th that is no, th that's not, an, uh, <laughs> that's not no a secret. secret. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and that, that has an impact on uh, whether it is debt repayment mm or even the spiral uh, effect in mm. terms of the ecosystem. Oh, yes. Because if I'm going to depend on uh, a payment from government, mm. and then I have to also pay my suppliers and all the other people within the ecosystem, mm. it's actually going to affect everything. Indeed. So um, I like that they are uh, coming up with policies. Mm. Uh, we like what they, uh, the FIA is doing. Mm. Uh, there is a, a program that they have set up uh, against corruption. Mm. Uh, that's fair enough. Mm. Uh, we have the infrastructure around the anti-corruption court and the laws and everything else. Mm. Uh, we, we are grateful for a lot of that. Mm. But uh, ultimately, how much of this will trickle down to uh, the SME? And so when we, uh, as an SME, we decide, okay, government business is too complicated. Yes. Uh, firstly, uh, I need to have a registration with the PPDA. I need to have the, uh, yes, the TIN mm. number and everything else that comes along. Mm. So somebody says, okay, uh, this same product I actually have to sell. If I took it to uh, somebody in um, uh, my next door neighbor, mm. you pay me cash. So why do I have to go through all that other bureaucracy? Mm. We, we saw that in the, uh, the supply of, um, uh, I think it was relief food yeah. during the, the, the COVID, oh, yes. oh, the yes. COVID uh, mm. issues. And we had all the press um, we covered that information. Story, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we had all that information. But it was about painful. Yes. yes. So now you have somebody in Kisenyu who says, I have my, uh, my bag of, uh, of flour mm. and I want to sell it. Uh, then you're telling me I have to carry it and then deliver it to yes. uh, uh, point X. Yes. Then it's going to be checked. Verified. Yes, verified and everything yes. else. Mm. And someone says, but if another customer is going to come from Soroti or wherever it is, mm. buy it the way it is. Mm. Why do I bother with, uh, uh, the, government with the government oh, uh, yeah. activities? Mm. So uh, I believe the, the challenge is uh, SMEs want to survive. Mm. The government is setting up standards perfect mm. and uh, that has to exist mm. but between that and uh, the survival side of it will it's not going to happen overnight well, yeah. and it's and so it's a process mm. and uh, a lot a lot of people have to invest in that middle area mm. uh, because um, the government is saying this is the standard with which we want to operate mm. and then uh, like the banks are saying would wish to uh, finance uh, businesses at level X mm. and the uh, person at the SME level is saying all I need to do is pay my rent uh, my carry milk and costs, bread home activity I'm yes <laughs> I, I, that's all. so uh, they, they there will be definitely a breed that has to get out mm. in the SME mm. uh, space and there's going to be a new breed that's going to come and say uh, in order for me to do business I want to work with standards oh, yes. because uh, education has done a lot mm. uh, and um, uh, uh, statistically they say uh, we have the highest uh, education in East Africa. Very much so. So uh, a lot of uh, people have been exposed to the fact that, okay, I want to uh, produce a product that is similar to what uh, is probably made in the USA or consumed mm. anywhere else. And so um, this breed is the one that will actually create the demand for the standards and the that change actually, you yes. see. so the older uh, the older generation of smes that mm. have decided that okay we're going to do uh, hand to mouth mm. they have to phase out 
Oh, so it's a process we equally need to embrace. Yes. Okay, exactly. now, we're going online. Those who have sent your questions, please, the number is on your screen. You're going to call in and you're going to ask your question. You, you be very definitive who you're sending your question to. If it's going to Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, be very blunt on that. If it's going to Ghana Investment Authority, please do the same. And if it's going to the bank, that is DFCU Bank, we'll actually have that. I'll start one with the one here. That is on Facebook and rather on Twitter, it's Miranda Footy. Again, I will apologize about the handles, the names these people use online. <laughs> Directors, you'll, you'll, senior executive, you'll, you'll bear with me. But we'll start off. This one says, for instance, in the schools, what happens when students have very good innovation? Are they paid for it? Are they supported further by government to put it out there? How does it work? That's coming to you, uh, Musti. And then someone here says that, uh, um, is there a specific, a specific period of time set for these trainings for the SMEs you're talking about earlier? That is to you, Oscar. The, and, and how do we get to know about them? the trainings for the SMEs, if someone wants to be a part of them. Please drop your questions. The hashtag is a top 100 SMEs at 20, uh, 20, and we get to know uh, how exactly all this is happening, and we see exactly um, what is going on. Well, this is going on here. Someone has asked a question here. Okay, now this one is saying, I love the knowledge displayed on this hashtag. Thank you so much, NTV. Well, we are very much indebted. Uh, someone here is asking, talking about Bubu. That is by Uganda Build Uganda. If I may bring it closer to the uh, Uganda Investment Authority. All you're saying here, if I was one of those SMEs, I would be jumping up and singing Kumbaya because this would be reality. How do we beat the ceiling, Mr. Elia? How do we beat the ceiling when it gets to Bubu? Like they have the products, they've tried to put it on the market, but it's not shifting. They're seeing the same old things coming through. Then, um, uh, okay, uh, a lot is going on. A lot is going on here. Okay. Well, someone trying to hack into my account, please don't. Um, <laughs> someone is saying that according to the local content bill, um, all big government projects require at least 40% labor during execution. However, most SMEs are not ready for these big contracts. Now, the question is, how do you implement that mm. on your side as government? How do you make sure that these are met and they're really working and no one is just going to get over them? Mm. I'll start with the SME. Your question came in first from Miranda. Okay. Miranda Fruity. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, our... Um, <coughs> What, what we have done is uh, for those SMEs that uh, choose to uh, join the platform, mm. they can uh, visit our website, which mm. is uh, www.savemysme.com mm -hmm. as one word. And um, the other thing is that uh, the initial engagement for mm. uh, SMEs is actually free. It's a pro bono service. Okay. And uh, the, the purpose is really more of a discovery mm. to find out what uh, needs do you have. Mm. And uh, once that's discovered, then the subsequent engagement would be between the professional and mm. the uh, Save My SME and the um, SME owner, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, at a uh, subsidized rate. Mm. And uh, this is designed really to, uh, based on how much the demand is for the uh, activity that is required. Mm. And uh, what we're looking to do really is, um, for example, uh, an accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, do we still need, uh, talking about the business models again, do we mm -hmm. still need uh, a whole flow of accountants mm -hmm. or uh, a set of uh, lawyers or, or uh, other... Uh, I can just have people. my quick books and I'm good. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So now, if, uh, if we can have an accountant who comes, for example, to my place for uh, two or three hours mm -hmm. and then can go to another SME for another two or three hours, nice. it will have solved the problem of my bookkeeping mm -hmm. and will have equally uh, solved the problem of redundancy. Oh, yes. Because this accountant would ordinarily wouldn't have gotten a job, mm. but he can now service five different SMEs, giving them uh, three or four hours of their time, mm. and everybody is actually doing a benefit. Because mm. we're talking about uh, COVID right now and survival. Oh, yes. And so it's important that uh, models like this are built and uh, exercised because this is how we actually move out of this particular environment. Nice. And then tomorrow when they are able to uh, afford these people, they might choose to uh, fully hire a person of that caliber. Mm. Yes. Okay, coming to you, Mosty. 
Uh, what happens to these uh, students who have these ideas in school? The innovation at school is asking what happens. Are they paid? Uh -huh. Now what happens is that the ministry does not come and pick your innovation and own. Mm. Our role as Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation is to support, coordinate and then promote research and innovation in this country. Mm. So, and we are saying you don't wait until somebody has reached university then you come and say you're supporting innovation. Mm. You need to inculcate that culture of innovation right from primary schools and secondary schools. Mm. I mentioned that we give the, a theme, mm -hmm. and then we give challenges around the theme. Mm. We can give students like three, four months and say you're going to try to come with a solution to this. These are the innovation challenges. Yeah, and there are people down there who are mentoring them through the process so that you develop the idea, you actually progress the idea in some sort of a proof of concept. Mm. Now. Uh, we're working with engineering, year, year engineering solution. At proof of concept, we come and students compete. Mm. We cannot take all of them, but we take the best ideas. Mm. We should be progressed to prototypes, and eventually, if you want to commercialize, mm. that is when the commercial banks come and give you money. Mm. Because starting innovation is like doing a research. You don't know where it falls. Oh, yeah. Yeah? It's it actually something that may, may collapse, it mm. may succeed. So we come in, support the students, up to the level of prototype. There are a few who have benefited to commercialize. When we see that it is okay, your idea is okay, the prototype is good, the mm. market is willing to take, it makes economic sense, mm. then we give you the little money to commercialize. But at that point, we encourage you now to go to commercial banks. Mm. And that's the reason why in this top 100, you see that the ministry has come, DFC Bank is present, oh, yeah. there's UIA, because we have different roles. Oh, yeah. So we support through the process, and to some extent we give money to commercialize but not always okay but <laughs> that, that was my that was the corner yeah. i was waiting for yeah thank you director now coming back to the uganda investment authority the question that came from a ugandan who said that he's he's really trying and he loves this entire thing he would be singing kumbaya because it sounds very interesting that but was the uh, ceiling the ceiling out to be yes. the ceiling. um it comes back still to our story where we were catch up and top up mm. um the ceiling to be beaten is for you to meet what the market wants. Mm. And the market wants a standardized product. Yes. So if you're having a product, it's a local product, mm. and you're lacking the QMAC, mm. at least uh, what we can help, we are, you, Yuri, I think, and us, we can at least facilitate you to get the QMAC. Mm. We first give you the SMAC, we try out, then we give you the QMAC. Mm. Because we have also uh, product mentors. We take, ah. uh, like at Yuri, they take you, Yuri and I think Food and Agriculture at Makere, mm. they take your product and they standardize it up to that level wow. of where they, because there are, there are many products, especially in the honey and uh, coffee, mm. those uh, wow. wine, people mm. really were had challenges at, in the beginning, mm -hmm. but now if you go to the supermarkets, most of the honey which uh, is, uh, is on the shelves mm. is local, then uh, most of the wine which is on the shelf is local, because mm. if, if they give you South African wine and they give you better wine, ah. you, may miss, you may miss the South African and you go for better. But even then, the uh, uh, director here from most had, had mentioned about it, government mm. is trying to squeeze out. We are doing import substitution, mm. directly and indirectly. Because like now, th the tiles, you go to Naka, Nakasero down here, mm. the tiles people at, at first were ignoring goodwill tiles, mm. but now goodwill is all over the place because right. there's nothing the the importers can do. Mm. They can't compete with the good retailers. Mm. And then uh, the other question was, um, we, these people who, are, who aren't local content, but they, can, they are not ready. Yes. This way I thank my brother Wanok and uh, his colleagues in the banking industry. Mm. They've taken up the ready, making uh, their clients ready to take up these contracts. Mm. So what they do, they expose them to these contracts. Oh, nice. Before Wanok gives you his money, if it prepares you to take up this contract. Mm. I, th I, I have seen it in uh, Wanoko's bank and uh, another bank from South Africa. Mm. They're doing this. And also these uh, contractors have mm. gone into associations like UNABSEC. UNABSEC mm. is the contractor's as association. Mm. And then uh, also I think the two are people. Before they talk on these contracts, they go in as associations and they measure within themselves as members. Can I take this Can on? we take on this giant? Mm. If we can't take, how can we unbundle it? Mm. Unbundling is how can we break up the forte? Yes. For you are being- Subcontracting. Yeah. Yes. Not subcontracting. Mm. Now they've been subcontracted, mm. but they're unbundling that subcontracted piece. Ah, amongst themselves. Yeah, amongst themselves. Uh -huh. So one says, for me, I'll do the cement. For mm. me, I'll, I'll do the metal, uh, the, the steel. Mm. Then for the other one is that, for me, I have the labor. Mm. The other one is, for me, I have the equipment. Okay. So they go in as a, a special purpose vehicle. Okay. So the Chinese. Mid the 40%. Yes. The Chinese comes alone and mm. these guys do an SPV 
and they and enter they into the project. There is a question here coming in from Sandra Letio. She says, I am an, a manufacturer, but when you look at the industrial policy, I'm not sure if fine amendments have been made. We want to see country with favorable policies for manufacturing, especially when it gets to... Um, manufacturing seems to be the core of a national revival, but um, the thoughts when it gets to manufacturing seems to be not applicable to Ugandan manufacturers. What's your comment on that? But the industrial policy has just been uh, amended. Mm. I don't know which sector particularly she's manufacturing mm. from. Oh, yeah. she goes ahead and says, we need better financial policies. Most foreign investors have less than 9% interest rate and local investors have interest rate of 25%. How do you expect us to compete favorably, Mr. Elia? Babra. That is a Sandra Letio, yeah. a manufacturer in Lira district. Sa Sandra, last, uh, the last time Barbara was here and she exhausted UDB loans to SMEs. Oh yes. Because UDB now has a, a financing line of about 100 million US dollars mm. from the uh, from the Islamic Development Bank strictly for SMEs. Okay. And this money is available. UDB is making calls mm. specifically to SMEs to go and tap this money mm -hmm. from startups. Because people are fearing that UDB is not financing startups. Mm. But they are now making calls for I know that this is where the, the problem, and sometimes I blame government, mm. although now we are improving, the way we pass on information to our, our SMEs so. yes, is also yes. lacking. Mm. But you did be sent out a call, uh, told those people who don't know, who are in up country and they, there's no branch for UDB, you go through Post Bank mm. and you then apply for this money. The money is available. Mm. So, Sandra, try that line. It's available. Okay. Uh, this is a question that goes to you, um, Director from uh, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. How do we enhance? Okay, it starts like we must address this question of manufacturing from a perspective of how we can make Made in Uganda more competitive. Mm. But then it says, how do we enhance innovation and technology absorption into the production process in Uganda? Good question. Mm. Uh, remember I said there is a, a disconnect between research, mm. uh, government and to some extent the business people. Mm. You find many professors in Makerere <coughs> doing mm -hmm. their research. You go to different innovation hubs, you get all types of technologies, mm. but the SMEs and businesses are also moving their own path. Okay. So what we are trying to do, we are organizing innovation pitch. Mm. And this is very common actually in, uh, in China. Mm. So we, we are organizing a monthly pitch where we bring, we select, say this month we are selecting five innovators in areas of health. Mm. And then we bring the SMEs or the business people in the fields or where who are doing something related to health. Mm. They pitch. And this is where the issue of intellectual property is important. You need to protect first. Okay. You come and pitch. You say, this is what we are able to do. Mm. A, B, C, D. If you adopt this technology, it's going to ease your business in the way A, B, C. This is how you are going to get efficiency. Mm. But now this is where you bring the private sector. This is mm. where you bring uh, SMEs to support research, to support innovation. Mm. So when you are entering into, into a relationship, some people may want to get equity. Oh, yeah. Others may say, no, I've already developed the technology. I'm selling it off. Mm. Others say, I'm giving this amount of shares. Mm. So that is already happening. And it's the reason why the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation came into this arrangement of the top 100. Mm. Because we have the different regional fora, right. and it's our plan to bring these top innovators to pitch, to present when there are 100 SMEs seated in the house. Mm. So if you pick interest, then you're able to negotiate, talk, and then improve. And that's the only way we are going to improve our efficiency. Remember I talked about cost, mm. time, and quality. Oh, yeah. You're not going to innovate in product, process, or marketing innovation if you don't appreciate the new ideas which is coming. Very much so. Yes. Well, you can give us now the call. Um, I just have like uh, five minutes to get this done. Give us a call. The number is right on the screen. Give us a call and ask your question to whoever you want to ask that question. If it's going to the Ministry of um, Science, uh, Technology and Innovation, be very blunt on that. If it's going to Ghana Investment Authority, who seems to be having a lot of questions here, you can still send that question. And if it's going to the bank, that is a DFCU bank, you can still ask those questions. But um, just to go a little bit about uh, this and how the questions are coming in, I still want to go to um, some questions here that were very, very interesting. If I should, if you may allow me to, to just get these questions. All right, someone here said, okay, now I already read that one. Um, someone asked a question that... Um, have you asked yourself a question, Mr. Area? 
why is manufacturing in Uganda not shifting and what can be done to do better, especially in investment? Andrew, that is a question for a full session. You're going to break it <coughs> down in two minutes. You are a senior <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> investment uh, expert. But uh, most, m m most of the things that uh, our, our, uh, my, my director here has mentioned it already is that mm. we are changing policy, we are shifting policy. Okay. And now the things that we, we are doing, import substitution, mm. manufacturing was fighting with cheap imports. Oh, yes. That's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. so now, once we are shifting that policy, we are trying to promote our exports. Mm. Because the market is there mm. across the country. Mm. The market is there and uh, we, ha we have to add value to our, our, pro our products and mm. then we shift them around. Okay. So it, shift, it was a policy shift and oh. now we've adopted to it because of thanks to COVID. Okay. So we believe, <laughs> <laughs> we believe uh, soon, we yeah. believe soon our, our manufacturing industry is going to thrive so much. Then there also there were issues on our side. Mm. Electricity was not there, but now we have enough electricity. Okay. Uh, raw materials issues, but now you can see we have, we are th thriving on that. Mm. Uh, the issue is that most we were exporting raw, mm. raw products, but now, now we're saying final the, pro the policy, the government policy is that add value mm. before you, you ship out anything. So the policy shift which has taken, is and that's the, the other person who talked about the industrial policy. That is Sandra. Yes, now yeah. the policy shift has, is, has come okay. in, so we expect the manufacturing to thrive. To, okay, uh, you wanted to add on that? Yes, mm. uh, I think one of the uh, uh, questions around the manufacturing conversation mm. is really about uh, the fact that uh, what comes first, is it the law or is it actually development? Mm -hmm. uh, that question has been uh, going it all around. It has been ongoing, yes. Yes. So uh, do we uh, seek to innovate first and then we have a law that uh, manages that? Mm. That, that w uh, seems to be the more appropriate way. Mm. For example, we had the mobile money come through. Oh, yeah. We are only getting the uh, regulation or the law <laughs> now. Just recently. Yes, just recently. Mm. So um, I think what the uh, other people talk about manufacturing need mm. to get back to the basics. Oh, yes. Uh, the uh, economics of uh, demand and supply mm. and then coming back to the business model mm -hmm. how do they actually want to uh, undertake this are they going to be uh, serving another manufacturer with a chemical for example let's look at the uh, paint mm. uh, manufacturing mm. uh, there's a chemical that they need to uh, use to mix that mm. paint are they are they seeking to get involved in that uh, supply chain or that value chain mm -hmm. are they looking at agriculture are they looking at our, uh, another set of um, uh, value chains in terms mm. of manufacturing. Mm. So they need to choose their fight and ah. start because uh, policy might take for forever. But you need to get rolling. You need to get rolling. Okay. So it's important as, a, as an SME, uh, mm. their thoughts should be more about what can I do? Because mm. the framework will come uh, mobile money came yesterday, yes, 2019. The founders are rolling. Yes, already right? rolling. So yes. uh, it's really coming to control mm. a few vices have actually been identified. Mm. So most, most important is start. The rest will, will actually you. follow. All right, this is the last question that goes to you, um, Robert Wanok, and says, what does it take for us as a nation to bounce back better after COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how will we recover from the challenges of an overwhelming demand shrinking with a revenue base? Thank you. Mm. Um, I, I think it goes back to the earlier statement that I said. I think we are not short of ideas as a, as a country. In fact, I think our real challenge is how do we get out of, uh, uh, how do we get ourselves out of getting stuck in the old ways? And uh, for me, I would actually say that the, the, this economy is actually really ready to uh, bounce back. Because if you look at what is core to us, and I think uh, one of the callers alluded to it, if you look at what is immediately gotten back on track, you have agriculture and manufacturing those seem to come out at least very clearly that we are an economy that can easily go in there. So if we begin to start looking at how do we stimulate, because we don't really have proper stimulus, but how do we stimulate the current people that are involved in that to be able to uh, get uh, the sort of uh, financial stimulus that they need to begin manufacturing and uh, also producing uh, goods and, uh, and, and crop in a way that they can actually go out and compete uh, favorably. Uh, the other area that we've spoken about is uh, a deeper look into our entrepreneurs. I think a lot of businesses really need to rethink uh, their current business models. There is a very likely uh, challenge that's on our hands that some businesses might not be able to wake up out of COVID, post-COVID. 
but I think that a, a digital revolution has come in. Uh, some people are calling it the Great Reset. That reset has its benefits. There are people who are actually winning out of this. And I think businesses need to start thinking through uh, how do we get out of these risks. And I think for me, I'll just say five key uh, risk areas that I think need to be looked at. Can you manage stock? And right now when we talk about stock, uh, it's about the way you sell also, mm. what you sell, the goods that you sell. Mm. If you look at that from a perspective uh, of uh, uh, the risks that come along with it, are you selling the right commodity and how are you selling it? Mm. Do you need to move that into an online port? Mm. Do you need to give away margins? Some people have been making really crazy margins in, in, in Uganda. Mm. Is it possible for you to shrink? and give away price and sell and still be able to take your stock out. Mm -hmm. The other one is debt. Uh, how do you actually manage debt at this point? And uh, debt can be through the, the way your business is actually done, or you could actually be owing debt out. And the banks have come in, as a bank, we've sit, certainly come in and, and done the restructure. Mm -hmm. But like I said in the last show, uh, Andrew, yes. come March. <laughs> When this moratorium is over, oh, what yes. do we do? Do those doors keep on opening? Will those business be able to uh, come back and sustain? Mm. And I think that conversation has to be had at a very relational level mm. between you and your banker. Then the other one, of course, is creditors. How do you manage your creditors? Mm. Uh, the same way we are actually treating you. Uh, we also encourage that uh, our businessmen, our businesswomen actually go out there and begin to start rethinking. Can you renegotiate some of your contracts that are out there? Are there some quick wins that you could be able to look out for? Are there costs that you could be able to do away with? Do you need to shrink at this point? And then some of the uh, toiling areas that we see a lot of our investors around taking on huge projects that are capital intensive in nature, especially mm. construction. Mm. Ugandans, when they make money to a certain level, love to put up that apartment block. They love to put up hotels. Yeah. But now is the time for you to assess, do you need to be m deploying capital? Why not pull back on capital intensive projects and begin to start looking nice. at operational costs mm. that will look at the next three to five years? Mm. Then assets. Are there assets that you can rethink? People have talked about uh, re-looking at space. Mm -hmm. Restaurants have turned into online delivery shops and re rejigged their space. Mm -hmm. Everybody is sort of going the Uber route and Uberized in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Are there, can your assets, can your vehicles be now transformed into maybe delivery vehicles? Can they be for hire? Can they be sold off? Do you need a fleet? Mm -hmm. Do you need to rethink uh, some of those things? And then, of course, finally, the, f the, the question that we spoke about earlier on, uh, our people need to start thinking about insuring their businesses, yeah. take on insurance. And uh, certainly from a bank perspective, uh, we have uh, bank assurance products that are out there mm -hmm. and we're able to come in and relook at uh, areas that were previously considered as, as risky, like mm -hmm. even uh, weather risky areas. And the banks are actually coming and saying that we can come in and insure you even for crop, mm -hmm. even for your crop life. So those are really the key areas okay. that I think would take for you to be able to bounce back. Well, thank you so much. That is Robert Wenoka from the DFCU Bank Head, personal and business banking. This brings us to the end of our conversation this year of the top 100 SMEs. I want to thank all those that started with our serialized conversation from the very first one to this very last one, the grand finale. We've had remarkable people. We had Mr. Oscar Gio from B, the director of Save My SME. We have had Mr. Robert Wenog, the head of personal and business banking from DFCU Bank. We have had Mr. Elia. Kawireku, uh, who happens to be a senior investment executive from the Uganda Investment Authority. And we've had Mr. Basila Jar, Director Techpreneurship from the Ministry of Science, Innovation, Science, Technology and Innovation. And you, my great viewer, who has been a part of this conversation. But these are the takeaways from me. If you're one of those who wants to get an investor license, log on to www.ebs.co.ug. And just so you know, if you're an innovator, please, DFCU Bank has what they call the Baraka Loan. Log in and get to know what is happening. My name is Andrew Chamagero. Until next year, in the top SMEs, uh, the top 100 SMEs, let's have this conversation run. Go to those websites. Go to these offices. Knock on these doors. If you're an SME, there is a lot more we need to do. Have a lovely evening. Thank you.